you haven't seen my introduction to thermodynamics video then click on the link in the description you probably need to watch that before coming on to this so we are talking about engines and efficiency and the second law of thermodynamics and heat pumps and refrigerators as well so first thing let's go back to our pv diagram for a four stroke engine and it has this shape here air and fuel is taken in spark expands again and then the exhaust fumes are pushed out now we can call this an indicator diagram and this is a real or actual indicator diagram of what's going on inside a four stroke engine four stroke engine one two three four because the piston goes one, two, three, four. The reason that it's not a complete loop is because we're not using the same gas every time, are we? We're bringing in some air and fuel and then sending it back out once it's combusted the exhaust fumes and then we bring another lot in. And so it's not the same piece of gas. If we were, however, to draw a theoretical indicator diagram, we sort of take off this bit here and so we just deal with the expansion and compression. Now this theoretical diagram is called the Otto cycle. And this can only be true if we assume a few things. That is that the engine uses the same gas and that's pure air. And if you remember the adiabatic or adiabatic constant from last time, gamma is 1.4. That's not the same as our monatomic adiabatic constant. Two, changes in pressure and temperature are instantaneous. Three, the heat source is external. We know that that's not true, don't we? Because the heat source is the gas that goes in. It's inside the engine. And four, that it's perfectly efficient mechanically and so there's no friction. So with that assumption, we can model a four-stroke engine with four processes. A, what's going on here? Gas is compressed. We can see that. Is it isothermally or adiabatically? We know it's one of the two. It's adiabatically. B, I haven't drawn that perfectly. It should be a straight line going up like that. And so that should tell you what's going on with the volume. V is constant. And if you remember, that's when we have the spark. And so that means that a reaction is happening. So heat is being supplied. C, the gas is expanding. It's expanding adiabatically. So if that's true, then we know that Q is zero. So that must mean that the internal energy of the gas is going down as well. Therefore cooling, it's cooling adiabatically. And then finally D is cooling here at a constant volume. And then the whole process starts again. Like we said, that isn't what happens in reality. This is what happens in reality, but we can model it theoretically. And that allows us to do uh, some maths with that. For a diesel engine, we said that it's compressed gas that goes in. And so we don't have the spark as the gas is being compressed. What we have is the gas being compressed. And then we have the spark at the top. And so that's when heat is supplied. Heat is supplied at a constant pressure and then pretty much the rest of it is the same. So for diesel, heat supplied at constant P, that's because we're using compressed air. Now we said last time that the net work done by an engine is the area inside of the loop, and so that's one good reason to have an auto cycle instead of an actual indicator diagram because it allows us to easily approximate what the net work is going to be. So that's the energy that is supplied to your car, which then makes it move. And so because it's not perfect, we call it indicated power. Now, when it comes to power, etc., because this is a loop and it's constantly going round and round and round, we're not really concerned with how much work is done by one loop. We're concerned with how fast it does work, or in other words, the power. And so we want to know what indicated power is. And so that's going to be equal to the network done per cycle. But we know that if indicated power is watts or joules per second, then we need to find out how many of these are done per second. And so that's going to be time cycles per second. If you have, say, a four or six cylinder engine, then we know that we're just going to multiply by this as well. So number of cylinders in the engine. So we can say that that is almost the power going into the engine. It's not quite as simple as that, but we'll get onto that in a minute. Output power is not called output power. It's actually called brake power. When you hear the phrase like uh, brake horsepower, you might think, hang on a second, but we don't want a car to brake, we want it to go. But yeah, that's what we call it. We call it brake power. Of course, we know that these two are not gonna be the same because we know that no engine is in reality frictionless. So we have to take friction into account, don't we? So the indicated power, take away the brake power, that's the 
input power, as it were, take away the output power, gives you our work done against friction per second. So in other words, friction power. Now you can actually use brake power to find out the torque of an engine, because if you remember from rotational dynamics, because we have this piston going up and down, and that is translated into circular motion as it's connected to the crankshaft, which goes round, and then that turns your wheels. We know from rotational dynamics that power is equal to torque times angular speed. And so this is where engines and rotational dynamics come together. However, we need to think about where does the power come from to begin with? Well, that comes from the fuel itself, the chemical potential energy that then is released. In other words, the heat supplied by the fuel per second. And so actually input power is equal to, well, we can call it calorific value. In other words, that's just EG joules per kilogram, or that could be joules per, let's say meter cubed, something like that. So how much energy do you have in a certain amount of the fuel times fuel flow rate? And that will be in either kilograms or meters cubed or something like that, EG, kilograms per second or meters cubed per second. And so if you multiply these two things together, you're ending up with joules per second. So let's just go over this. I've written these in the wrong order, but it doesn't matter too much. Input power, that's the power that comes from the fuel itself. That then enables the engine to do work, and that's your net work done. And that's not gonna be 100% efficient. We'll go into that in a second. And then we have our output power after that. And then finally, we can calculate our friction power, which is the difference between them. Okay, so let's have a look at different efficiencies that we can calculate for an engine. First one is thermal efficiency, and that's equal to our indicated power divided by our input power. Now, if you remember what we just said, indicated power is work done per second, and input power is our calorific power, as it were. So in other words, this is telling us how much of the power that we get from our fuel is actually translated into work done. Now, notice that I haven't put a times 100 because, yeah, usually we give efficiencies as 50%, 25%, whatever. But when you get into thermodynamics and maybe you go on to degree level, that kind of thing, we give just a decimal. And so this is going to give us a decimal answer. And in fact, you know, that's easier when it comes to calculating other things. We don't need to turn it back from a percentage into a decimal in order to use it. So it's useful to think about efficiencies as decimals. Then we have mechanical efficiency. And so we said that we have our brake power. That's what's actually gonna be used to drive our car divided by the indicator power. And we know what indicator power is there as well. Now can you see that neither of these give the overall efficiency of an engine. And so we have one more and that's overall efficiency. And you can probably guess what this is. That's our brake power. That's what we finally get out of the engine divided by the input power from our fuel. And it might seem obvious, but we can say that no engine is 100% efficient. And you know what? We've just stumbled across the second law of thermodynamics. And you might think, well, that doesn't seem that important. That's sort of just obvious, isn't it? But actually that serves a really, really important purpose. If this wasn't true, engines wouldn't work, which makes it kind of ironic. Now the second law of thermodynamics can be sort of thought of like this. In order for work to be done, heat must flow. Let's draw a diagram just to show what's going on with temperatures and heat and work, shall we? Here's our source of heat in our engine, and that is hot. And here's our heat sink. Now a heat sink is just something that takes heat away. In the summer, you might hear your radiator going in your car. That's because it has to get rid of heat from the engine. On your computer, you have fans and grills that get rid of hot air. They're getting rid of that heat from your computer, otherwise it doesn't work as well. So this is cold or cold air. And this is our process that's going on in the middle. Now we know that heat must be transferred and we know the gas and the piston, we get work out from that. That's what then drives your car. But then we must have some heat going to the heat sink. We can't have all of our heat going to the work done because it's never gonna be 100% efficient. Let's call this QH, let's call this QC. And so therefore we can see that the work done is going to be 
the heat going in, take away the heat coming out. Now this always has to be true. Now here's the rub. If this heat sink, and we can say, e.g. the engine itself, you know, the block, the cylinder, the pistons, the heat sink was same temp as the source, that would be the fuel, no heat could flow. Therefore, no work can be done. This is the bit that used to confuse me the most in thermodynamics, and it still confuses me, I've got to be honest. It's one of those things that you can think about for ages and you can go back and forth, but in the end, you just ultimately have to accept it. Put it this way, let's think about an exothermic reaction in chemistry. You know that we have the energy of the reactants and then the products, and they go like that, and the energy decreases. However, where does the energy go to? Well, it goes into the surroundings. But if the surroundings were the same temperature, then that energy could not actually flow. That heat couldn't come out of the reaction. And so therefore, the reaction wouldn't happen. You can think of Le Chatelier's principle and equilibrium and all that jazz. Think about it in terms of the PV diagram. If you had expansion and compression of the gas that was all adiabatic, then there would be no loop, just a line. It would just go up and down. You need an area within the loop in order for network to be done. And the only way that that is possible is if there is heat transfer. If that helps you understand it a little bit more, great. But don't think about it too much. It's just one of those things that you need to actually just go, okay, I know that has to be true, even if I don't fully understand it. Therefore, we can actually calculate efficiency of an engine by taking our work done and dividing by the energy going in. And of course, that's going to be QH minus QC over QH. Now, if theoretically 100% efficient, we know it can't be, then this is also going to be equal to the temperature up here. Take away the temperature at the heat sink divided by the temperature at the source. Obviously, they have to be in Kelvin, not degree C. Some power plants, when they burn fuel, they know that this has to be true. So what they can do is take some of this heat that goes to the heat sink and they put it back into the source and so they increase their efficiency that way. That can happen in a CHP plant or combined heat and power plant. So you say, engines, great, I want work, I don't mind things getting hot, I can put the heat somewhere, that can just escape, I get my work out. But what about if you actually want to make things colder, you want to decrease the heat in something. Now I'm going to call these cold space and hot space what if you wanted to take energy from a cold space to make it even colder, you need to put the heat into a hot space. What kind of thing uses that? Well, of course, something like air conditioning or a refrigerator. Do you know what? I do that every single time. Refrigerator doesn't have a D in, but fridge does, weird. The cold space is inside the fridge, or it could be in your car. And I'm just gonna say the hot space is outside. You need to get heat from a cold space into a hot space. In order to do that, you need to put in work. And so that's why you can hear a fridge humming because it is doing work on the gas in order to take heat energy from inside to outside. It's compressing the gas in order to do that. So because it's taking heat the other way, we can call this a reversed heat engine. So at the back of your fridge or freezer, you have a grill. And what happens, you have a closed loop of gas. It's not air, something like Freon. And the gas is compressed and expanded, compressed and expanded. And it takes the energy, takes the heat from inside the fridge, takes it to the grill at the back. And so that's why if you put your hand at the back of a fridge, it is hot because it is extracting that heat from inside. So same thing for air conditioning as well in your car. And also this can be used for a heat pump as well, actually. If you have a home, instead of using a boiler or whatever, that kind of thing, what you can do is have a heat pump in your home and it can do the same thing. It's basically reversed air conditioning. So it takes energy from the cold outside and it does work and it transfers the heat to the inside of your house. Now, because it's doing the opposite to what an engine does, we don't have something called efficiency for fridges. We have an equivalent called coefficient of performance. And that's equal to the energy taken away from the cold space divided by the work done. Can you see it's the just the reciprocal, as it were, of the efficiency equation for an engine. And of course, we can say that's QC over QH minus QC. And obviously, that's going to be more than one. The bigger this coefficient of performance is, the better it is at doing its job. 
because you're putting in less work to get that heat out. Similarly, if 100% efficient, it's never going to be, but the COP, just like last time with our engines, is gonna be TC over TH minus TC. For a heat pump, if you're transferring energy into your home from the outside, then we do it with QH on top and TH on top instead, because we are concerned with the amount of energy that we're putting into our home, not the amount of energy that we're taking out of the cold space. So that's it for thermodynamics, at least at A level. If you found it helpful, please leave a like, helps a lot. And if you have any questions or comments, then put them down below. I always love to hear from you guys. If you haven't seen the rotational dynamics video, then click on the card and it'll take you to that. And I'll see you next time.